Assalamu alaikum. Dear learners, this video is going to answer two questions. First, what are gravitational waves? And second, how we can measure them? So let's get started. To answer the first question of what gravitational waves are, I would like to refresh your knowledge of waves in general. A wave is something that has crusts and troughs. That is, at some point, the magnitude of whatever we are considering is more than the magnitude of other points and this pattern repeats. For example, if the price of Bitcoin or any other commodity is periodically rising and falling, we can say that the price is going in waves. That is, it is rising and falling. More concretely, imagine what happens when you drop something in a pool of stationary water. Water ripples are created, which may also be called water waves. Now, what is happening over here? The level of the water is rising and falling, hence creating a wave. Moving on, you must have heard something about the sound waves. Now, what are sound waves? Sound waves are compressions and rare fractions of air particles present in air. That is, at some points, the air particles are compressed towards each other, whereas at the others, they move away from each other. This wave is called a sound wave. And for the last example, what is an electromagnetic wave? An electromagnetic wave represents the energy which an electron has. And they vibrate in almost every possible direction because of that energy. Radio waves, microwaves, infrared waves, light waves, ultraviolet waves, X-rays and gamma rays are all electromagnetic waves. All these waves represents energy of electrons which are vibrating in any medium. So basically whatever type of wave you are talking about, it represents rising and falling of physical quantity or element. Just like these waves, gravitational waves will represent the rising and falling of gravity. Now that's something surprising. We know that on Earth, the gravity remains almost constant. So, there is no question of increased or decreased gravity. But that's not even 10% of the story of the gravity. The amount of gravitational force any body is exerting on other bodies is directly proportional to its mass. Therefore, larger the body, larger the gravity it will have. This thing is best explained through this image. Suppose that the mesh zone over here is an elastic sheet then the heavier the object you are going to place on this sheet, more dip or deformation you are going to see in this mesh. This mesh is extended to the whole universe and every star, planet or any other thing present in the universe is like an object placed on this mesh. The heavier the object, more deformation that object is going to cause on this mesh. Even you and me are also deforming this mesh. But that is so negligible as compared to large bodies like our planet Earth or the Sun or other celestial bodies. Therefore, we won't be talking about that. Now, what is dip or deformation representing? Simply stated, it is representing the amount of gravity. The lowest point in this pit will represent the gravity Earth will have on its surface. Therefore, as you move away from the surface, the gravity or the dip will become less and a position will come when you cannot feel the gravity of the earth. At this point, we will say that we are in space or out of the atmosphere of the earth. Just like this, every celestial body has its own gravity. Therefore, the sun will deform the space-time mesh more than the earth and some stars heavier than the sun will deform the mesh even more and hence will have more gravity. But what all of this have to do with the gravitational waves? Now suppose that if our sun, which has a certain gravity and deformed the mesh, moves quickly from one location to some other location, what is going to happen to this elastic mesh? Of course, the elastic mesh or the pit sun is creating on the mesh is going to move with it. It is just like a heavy ball rolling on an elastic sheet. Wherever the ball goes, the pit will go with it. Now suppose that 
we have this kind of image representing the gravity. This representation is technically called particle flow representation where each arrow is representing the gravity of the sun. As we move closer to the sun, the magnitude of the arrow increases, showing an increase in gravity. Now, if the sun moves, ideally these arrows should move with it. This happens but with a lag. That is, the motion of the arrows will lag behind the motion of the sun. Hence, you are going to experience a reduced gravitational force on one side of the sun as it is moving constantly towards one side. Furthermore, now suppose that the sun is moving to and fro, that is, it is vibrating about some point in space. Now, as the gravity is lagging behind, so will the pit the sun is creating on the mesh. Therefore, rapid forward and backward movements will generate a ripple in the mesh. These ripples are called gravitational waves. This whole thing is exactly analogous to dipping a spoon in water contained in a large container and moving the spoon to and fro at a reasonable speed. Water waves will be generated that will travel outwards. Similarly, gravitational waves are created because of the motion of large celestial bodies and these waves travel away from these bodies. In reality, white dwarfs, black holes and neutron stars are dense and heavy enough to produce gravitational waves that are observable on Earth using highly sensitive and state-of-the-art equipment. Moreover, it is rare for a single massive object or a body to generate gravitational waves. But few neutron stars are expected to be producing gravitational waves as they are spinning quite fast and waves are generated because of the imperfections in their spherical shape. On the contrary, binary star systems can generate gravitational waves quite easily as they consist of massive stars, black holes or white dwarfs circling around each other at a high rate. Normally this happens when two stars come so close to each other that they are locked into each other's gravitational field. They keep on rotating around each other and ultimately they collide and merge with each other. This is called a merger of black hole or a merger of stars. And before these bodies merge into one, when they were circling around each other, they were producing constantly gravitational waves. Now the question remains, how you can detect gravitational waves? Well, if a gravitational wave is passing through Earth, then Earth would be stretched on one side and compressed on the perpendicular side because of the decreased and increased gravity in a wave. You can understand this thing by supposing that if you are standing at this point, then along this direction, the gravity would be greater. Whereas if you move in this direction, the gravity would be smaller. So if the Earth is present, for example, over here, then in this direction, the gravity would be larger whereas in this direction gravity will be smaller and hence the earth would be expanded or stretched in this direction whereas compressed in the other direction. But have you experienced this kind of stretching? Of course never because this stretching is thousand times less than the diameter of a proton. So if this stretching is so small then we need something really marvelous to detect it. This is where I would answer the second question that I posed at the start of the video. How can we measure these gravitational waves? Displacements of such small magnitude are measured using devices called interferometers. Therefore, LIGO, which stands for Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, used modified and enhanced version of Michelson laser interferometer to detect gravitational waves for the first time in 2015. So let us understand the basic working of a laser interferometer. There are different versions of interferometers that utilize different kind of lasers, but the working principle remains the same. So the one I'm going to discuss utilize a dual frequency helium neon laser that generates laser light having two component frequencies 
that have a difference of 2 megahertz and are oppositely polarized. Just for clarity, polarization means the direction in which the electrons are vibrating in an electromagnetic wave. The two frequency lights constructively and destructively interfere with each other, producing light and dark flickers at a frequency of 2 megahertz. So, as this light is emitted from the source, it is split into two equal halves. One is directed towards a detector to act as a reference light beam, whereas the other one moves forward. The detector over here are made of phototransistors that are excited by the light flickering at 2 MHz. For the beam that travels forward, the next thing it encounters is called a polarizing beam splitter. This beam splitter allows one kind of polarization frequency light to pass through while reflect the other one. Therefore, at this point, the two frequencies are separated from each other and now they travel in orthogonal directions. At the end of the path of both light beams, there is a reflecting cube that completely reflect back the incident light. Therefore, both beams will be reflected back to meet at the same polarizing beam splitter. Once again, this beam splitter will reflect one kind of polarization frequency light and allows the other to pass through. This will cause both frequencies to merge once again. Now you must be wondering that how the displacement is measured. Well, if both waves have traveled the same amount of distance from the point where they were splitted to the point where they were merged once again, then the light beam received by the detector B will be exactly equal to the reference light beam received by the detector A. That is, both detectors will be receiving a flickering of 2 MHz spectrum. However, if one of the light has traveled a different length of distance than the other one, then detector B will receive a light pattern different than the reference beam at detector A. This difference will tell us how much difference in distance traveled by both beams is there. In normal lab setup, one of the reflecting cube is fixed at a particular distance, whereas the other is movable. However, for detecting gravitational waves, both reflecting cubes are fixed. The distance the light travel changes because of the physical stretching and compression of the Earth. As shown in this illustration, if a gravitational wave is passing through the Earth, it will stretch the Earth in one direction while compress it in the orthogonal direction. Therefore, the distance traveled by both light beams will be different and will be detected by the change in flicker pattern. This was what allowed an engineering masterpiece LIGO to detect gravitational waves. LIGO has installed two laser interferometers, one in southeastern Washington state and the other one in Livingston, Louisiana. The two legs of the interferometer are four kilometers long, comprising of steel vacuum tubes through which laser light is allowed to move without any kind of disturbance from the environment. To exactly pinpoint the location from where the gravitational waves are generated, we need to detect them at at least three different locations. Therefore, there is a project undergoing named as LIGO India through which a third observatory is being established in India. However, another similar observatory called Virgo has started working in Italy and scientists are uncovering mysteries of the universe by combining data of all these observatories. The first ever gravitational wave that was detected in 2015 was from a merger of two neutron stars located 1.3 billion light years away from Earth. If this kind of merger would have happened as close to Earth as the Sun is, the Earth would have elongated and compressed by around 3 meters. So with this, I would like to end this video and hope that you have understood the concepts related to gravity, gravitational waves and interferometers to a reasonable level. So this was everything and I hope that you have understood the major concepts. Take care and thank you.